has been very involved um, in um, addressing the, uh, the Weezer issue, including there was a major conference, what was it, GW yesterday? Just yesterday. Yeah, yeah just yesterday. yesterday. Um, um, so, uh, you know, I'm glad that you all could come, and uh, we're hoping for a productive situation. And if any of you want to do any follow-up to this meeting uh, in any way, um, feel free to get in touch with uh, one or both of us. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you for coming out on a cold day for what's really a very grim, um, grim subject, but of course an important one, um, and one that I think it's really you know, vital to get more information uh, out to you and to your friends and colleagues uh, elsewhere. So I've been doing quite a lot of these talks as I have many of my colleagues who work on Xinjiang or Uyghurs uh, or ethnic issues in China um, in general. As John just mentioned, there was a big symposium yesterday with a press conference just the day before. Uh, they got some publicity and these things have been going on in, in Europe and in Australia and in Japan and uh, in many other places. Um, what we have really, you can see this grim, this grim photo, um, is a situation of people being put in concentration camps for, for re-education. Uh, in particular, members of the Uyghur uh, ethnic group in China, um, but other Turkic Muslims in China as well. Uh, Kazakhs, uh, Kyrgyz, uh, perhaps some uh, Hui or Chinese Muslims, uh, and uh, even uh, the, the issue of Xinjiang and, this, and Islam in China in general has become uh, so dangerous, so toxic, that even Han Chinese uh, scholars and others who kind of venture into that have been getting, uh, getting in trouble as well. Uh, so I'm going to give you a lot of information um, about it, some interpretation, and um, then we'll have you know, some, time for, some time for questions. Um, so this situation that we're in right now with up to a million uh, people, mainly Muslims, or people from a Muslim minority group in China, uh, locked up in camps. Um, how did this begin? And where does it begin? This is one of the things I'm going to talk about. There was the approximate origins of it we can find in a campaign launched in 2014 called the Strike Hard Campaign Against Violent Terrorism. Uh, that was one of a succession of strike hard campaigns that have really been going on for decades in China. They're constantly announcing these uh, campaigns to uh, crack down, as they say, on extremism and terrorism. Uh, this time, though, was a little bit different. Um, this, for those of you who don't know, is the Xinjiang Uyghur region, Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Uh, there should be a Uyghur in this name. It's interesting. I didn't even notice this, but it's gotten dropped out um, of, the, of the name on this map, which apparently comes from Australia. Who knows? Anyway, um, in 2015, a new national security law targeting anti-extremism, as they called it, was promulgated in China as well, uh, with many items that are also relevant to, to what's going on now. In terms of criminal arrests, we've seen a boom in just the last year. You can see it's gone from, uh, it's gone up by a couple hundred thousand in Xinjiang alone, which accounts for the entire increase in arrests in China overall. Um, now this is 21% uh, of the arrests in China in 2017 took place in Xinjiang, although the population of Xinjiang is only 1.5% of China's total. Um, so a huge spike of people going into the criminal system. Besides that, there's a system of detention centers, uh, which are not logged in these statistics here. Uh, and really, this is only the start. Because the main subject of what I'm talking about today are the, uh, is what, I call it, what I'm calling the re-education gulag. Uh, a map, or a, a, a network of camps housing between 800,000 and a million uh, people uh, all around the region of Xinjiang. And these have really, they've been around since around 2015, there have been these uh, so-called, these, uh, these camps just go by various names, I'll talk about some of the names in a minute, uh, but um, they really blossomed, started expanding uh, in 2017, both in the size of individual camps and in the number of facilities that are around. Now, they go by such names as um, Educational Transformational Training Centers, Jiaoyu Zhuanghua, Peixun Zhongxin, 
the Chinese authorities denied their existence entirely uh, for several months after they first started being reported in Western media. Um, and then after that, um, and, but those denials took place even after Chinese sources themselves, internal media in China, had been trumpeting their existence. So you can see this photo here. It's from the, if you look at the bottom right corner, the Xinjiang uh, Legal Administration, Justice Administration. Uh, so this was part of internal media, internal propaganda, saying to a domestic audience, look how we're cracking down on these dangerous Uyghur people right, in the Northwest. But, after, but when Western news started coming out, they denied their existence. Uh, and then there was a brief story that said, well, some 400,000 people have been relocated for jobs, new jobs elsewhere. They floated that for a day, and then that story had been dropped. And finally, after being called out in the UN, they admitted to having a network of these um, facilities, but they, the, the line that is, that is crystallized is that they're vocational training centers where people are being taught a job, they're learning Chinese, and so on. Um, but even in this official propaganda, it's clear that uh, there's a point to this training. And, and you know, when they line people up and force them to give uh, you know, sort of positive comments about it, that is, people who are inside these, these so-called schools, uh, what they say makes very clear that the idea of these schools or camps is to reform thinking, to refashion their identity, uh, to make them more Chinese. Uh, and this comes out even in the you know, propaganda statements that we see. Uh, okay. So, the, as I said, the number of these camps has been expanding. Um, the, one of the ways we know about it, and I can go into the, the evidence about this in, in great detail if we want to, but one of the ways we know about this uh, is by uh, the publicly announced uh, budgets. And the spending on security in Xinjiang uh, went up by 200% last year, uh, some 20 billion yuan or $2 billion, something like that. So let's look at some of the pictures of, uh, of the camps here. Um, one of the ways we know about this is actually through the work of uh, independent scholars. There's one guy, a, a legal student up in Canada named Sean Zhang, um, who kind of made a hobby out of tracing these things, uh, first on Google Earth, and then other open source uh, satellite imagery companies have gotten involved in sort of comparing images over time. And when you do this, you can see the sorts of changes uh, that happen. So here, you know, a, a school, a soccer field, has been given over to these um, uh, Quonset hut type housing structures. Uh, da Banchang, which is a little bit outside of Urumqi, right out in the desert, you can see the changes there uh, and the building of this large facility there. Um, this has been analyzed quite closely by uh, architects working with the BBC. Uh, we're just going to give a little shout out to Sean because he's really done amazing work here. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter. And he sort of put together this. Okay, so these th are th just some pictures of some of the camps, of what they look like. Um, again, these are taken by various people, you know, journalists, walk right up to them. Uh, the architectural features, these guard towers, high walls, razor wire, um, you know, multiple fences, uh, the ubiquitous convenience police stations uh, along the sides, we'll see some more of those later, are all really part of the template uh, of these camps. So this is what we were just looking at from the satellite view. Camp in Torpan, um, which uh, the Wall Street Journal went to. Um, and you can see that it's actually expanded. This is, again, that corner. You can see that it goes back, or one of these corners, um, with multiple housing units. Here's one in Hotan, or Yitian. Uh, and then here, again, from the satellite photo, you can see here's the re-education center. Uh, it's still somewhat secured. There's barbed wire and so on around it. Uh, but then just down the road is a much bigger camp. Uh, and then again, looking at this site over time, here's the camp we were just looking at. So let's see if you spot on right, these two buildings here. There they are there. You see that it's been built out even further to the back with even more of these uh, compounds being planned. 
And again, here they built a new wall. You can see the guard tower and the wall. Uh, they haven't filled it in yet on this side. Uh, even the smaller camps and even ones that appear in Chinese media like this, here we have some um, cotters they look like visiting. Uh, again, highly secured barbed wire, inconsistent with what you would find around a school, vocational school. Uh, now this is quite interesting. This um, scholar, um, go with this one here. He was visiting the um, this city of Karakash or Moyu, and traveling through. Um, and he took pictures of this gateway. You can see it's, these are two sides of the gate. He was taking pictures of the poster, which talks about Xi Jinping his heart connected to the local the local people in a uh, very the, the kind of picture Mao Zedong used to like to have himself to portray as as well. Um, but what um, he, the, the Runa who traveled there, what he didn't notice at the time um, was what exactly this compound was. And going back later, he noticed it. Um, and so this is, as you can see, you know, uh, Jijong Jiaoyu It even has the word Jijong concentration in the name. <laughs> right? Uh, and this was a couple of years ago, so this is one of the ones some of these camps were kind of retrofitted schools or hospitals or those kinds of existing centers that were turned into the camps. Uh, the big new ones, though, if we look down here, here's the label on this one, in, also in the Khotan general area, it too has that name, Jijong. Now, the official sources from the PRC don't discuss the number of people in the camps, um, the length of time that they stay there, uh, how people are selected to be in, interned. Um, we know very few people who have come out of the camps after being interned since 2017. There are a few people who have come out, um, which gives us some information. But for the most part, for example, what we find out from Uyghurs abroad about who've lost you know, relatives into the camps, for the most part, um, people haven't come out again. So it's been upwards of many, many months or over a year uh, for most people that we know about. Um, the chairman of that is the, the head of the government of, of Xinjiang region, Shofat Zakir, uh, been talking about what they're trying, what, what students are supposed to be learning in these camps. And again, this is the official story. And so as we see, they want to learn uh, Chinese, they're getting scientific knowledge, they're enhancing their understanding of history, culture, national conditions, textbooks. They're going to learn about the law, the constitution, uh, and then at least one vocational skill, perhaps clothing and footwear making, food processing, Electronics, typesetting, e-commerce, hairdressing. I don't think these gentlemen here are good <coughs> for hairdressing or e-commerce, perhaps. But in any case, this is a rather large curriculum to expect people um, to make. One of the most distressing things about this is that uh, when parents, when adults get put away into the camps, uh, their children are becoming wards of the state. Sometimes they stay with grandparents, but there's stories of them ultimately being taken away from grandparents as well. There are distressing numbers of cases where one parent is outside of China, uh, the other is inside, and that person is, is put away. Sometimes the, the parent, there's several, many cases from Pakistan, where Pakistanis have Uyghur wives and children in China, and the Pakistani business is going back and forth. Their wives are put in camps, their children disappear. And nobody knows where they are. Um, so there are some orphanages, there was um, some business tenders looking for people who can work in these orphanages or to build these kinds of facilities for children. But a lot of the concerns about what's going on with kids and of course this fear that they're doing, going to be raised uh, as Chinese, you know, taught only Chinese. Um, all right, now, what do we know about what happens inside these camps? From the few people who've come out, we know that um, there are actually a range of them, and so some of the Chinese propaganda that talks about them, it talks about vocational schools, it shows people learning how to sew or do other kinds of trades. They may actually be filmed in real vocational facilities like that, um, but there are others that are much, much closer to, to prisons, and really quite grim prisons. Um, from what we know, uh, housing is very, uh, is very crowded, 8 to 12 or more to a room. People sleep and sit on <coughs> benches around the sides of the room. Uh, there's a single bucket or a toilet in the middle. People engage in forced calisthenics, starting with early morning runs. They sing propaganda songs praising Xi Jinping. They watch films. 
Um, there's some evidence of working in factories on site from some of these camps. We can see that there are factories or you know, uh, industrial facilities as part of that. Um, apparently, Chinese language education is part of it as well, but we don't know exactly you know, what form that takes, particularly with these older uh, inmates, and many of them are older. Um, there was one report from northern Xinjiang by a Kazakh that they were being taught Chinese uh, using the San Zijian, the three-character classic. And this is an ancient Confucian classic. It was very popular for teaching little boys uh, in the 19th century, uh, but it's, it's for rote learning, memorization. It's a rhythmical text like that. It's not a good way to learn Chinese. But very steeped in Confucian, uh, Confucian values, Confucian ideas. There's a lot of criticism of their culture, in the sense that Uyghur or, or Kazakh culture is backward, that Islam is backward, uh, forced self-criticisms to echo these points. Uh, all of this harkens back to Maoist kinds of approaches. There are stories that people are, are forced or given pork uh, to consume. People who don't display the right attitude uh, are subjected to more physical kinds of abuse. These include constraint positions, being forced to stand at a wall, um, being locked into an iron chair known as a tiger chair, deprivation of food, deprivation of sleep, solitary confinement. And there are reports from people who come out of suicides or attempted suicides. Certainly many people subjected to this kind of psychological torture uh, have suicidal feelings. And it's worth noting, too, that um, just in terms of thinking about the long-term effects of this policy, when you put hundreds of thousands of people, uh, you know, you incarcerate hundreds of thousands of people for long periods of time, just statistically, people are going to die, right? Particularly, there are a lot of elderly in there. You're going to have a number of people who die like this. And there are cases of you know, elderly relatives and others who have passed away in these camps. Their family members aren't given access to the bodies. Uh, no one knows exactly what's going on. So this will leave a legacy of common belief, even if it's not true, that abuse is responsible for the death of many people's, many people's relatives. Now, besides these kind of first-person accounts, uh, really kind of the strongest body of evidence that we have uh, is from Uyghurs abroad, you know, all over the world. And virtually everyone whom you talk to has at least one relative who's disappeared uh, into these camps. And the way you know this is because uh, first of all, they cut off all contact through WeChat, uh, so this messaging app, which is very popular in China, uh, or other ways. Um, sometimes, if they contact through a third party, a relative, a distant friend, um, they will very, very carefully write back, oh, so-and-so has gone to school, or so-and-so got malaria and had to go to the hospital, using these kind of euphemisms. Because, uh, of course, all communications like this are, can be monitored and, and, and increasingly are monitored by security um, forces. In terms of the numbers, it, the way we come up with these numbers of, uh, sort of 800,000 to a million, in part of it is looking at the capacity of the camps that have, that have been built. Uh, in part of it, it is from um, reports from local officials who uh, Radio Free Asia or other journalists actually just sort of call up and ask how many people have you put away. Um, and you find out sort of county levels, how many people are put away. You, you calculate what percentage of the Uyghur population in those areas that is. And this has been extrapolated by sort of all the areas and, and other um, sort of population data like that. Um, and then there's a document that came out. We don't really know the, the provenance. It looks pretty realistic that actually lists for a whole bunch of counties, not the main cities, but everything else, it lists the numbers very precisely of people who were put away by a certain period, it was back in 2017. Uh, and again, in terms of orders of magnitude and scale, that lines up with the estimates that we come up with through these other sorts of methods. So there's you know, various ways in which we're, we're coming to this information about what's going on and how many people are affected by it. It's not just, it's not just a guess. Now, according to official statements, these centers are for people who've committed um, minor crimes. Um, and they're being taught a trade to help them avoid extremism. Now, there's many reasons why we know that. That is not true. Part of it is that many doctors, uh, professors, 
all the Uyghur elites seem to be among the first people who have been put into uh, put into the camps, which is not to say they're not capable of committing crimes, but they certainly don't need vocational education and you know, seamsmanship, that kind of thing like that. Um, but the ideology, again, in official statements themselves, the sort of rationale and the metaphors that are used for what's going on here are really very telling. Um, you know, here you see, uh, I'll, I'll read some of it, you know, if we do not eradicate religious extremism at its roots, violent terrorist incidents will grow and spread all over like an incurable, incurable malign malignant tumor. Excuse me. Uh, so this is uh, preventive, right, is the idea. It's, it's not meant to be punishing people, it's meant to prevent crimes from happening. As we see, a certain number of people who've been indoctrinated with extremist ideology have not committed any crime, they're infected by the, by the disease. There's always a risk that illness will manifest itself at any moment, so they must have the virus cleansed, uh, and so on. Um, other statements, again, in official sources, um, use the metaphor of weed killer, uh, of chemotherapy, right, these sort of things. And what's interesting about that is, in both cases, it's the entire body or the entire field, good crops as well as weeds, that need to be treated in order for this kind of a, a approach to, to work. So that's clearly the thinking that's behind it. It's meant to be collective, uh, innocent people as well as everyone else, in order to wipe out what is seen as um, extremism. Uh, what makes this worse is that the notion of extremism itself, uh, this is really a catchword that has particularly since 2001, when China sort of latched on to the global war on terror uh, as a way of branding its separatist problem in Xinjiang. Um, the idea of extremism is, 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 is central to this concern about the Uyghurs and other Muslims in Xinjiang. But the definition of what comprises extremist thought, action, uh, behavior, uh, writings, and so on, has been expanding wildly. Uh, because it's not clearly defined, and there's as I see it, uh, you know, competition or at least incentives by at the level of uh, local officials uh, to, to fulfill the mandates coming down from the top through the most aggressive and broad attack on extremism um, possible. Uh, there was also a document released a couple of years ago uh, listing 75 manifestations of extremism. These and I'll tell you what some of those manifestations are in a minute. Uh, police pick these up in various ways uh, by scanning cell phones, for example, whatever kind of documents or, or communication are on there. Uh, but there's another way, and that is through home visits um, by uh, usually Han Chinese uh, Communist Party members. Um, some a million of them, it's been announced, have been sent to live in houses, of, in the homes with Uyghur families in southern Xinjiang mainly for up to a week, and then they visit again periodically. And this is a broad campaign called Becoming Relatives, Becoming Jiajin, Becoming Kin. Um, but the manuals that these uh, party officials have been given before they go, well, the, the, the propaganda about it all is you know, lots of friendly scenes, and they help out around the house, and lots of eating together, and singing songs, and helping these, teaching people to read. They're very paternalistic. They refer to the, the Uyghurs as younger sisters and younger brothers, with that kind of phraseology. But the manuals that these visitors are instructed with tell them to keep an eye out for all of this kind of extremism. Um, you know, watch out what is hung on the walls. Do they watch state TV, or do they seem to have you know, a lot of mysterious DVDs or videos lying around? And they're instructed, in particular, to talk to the children, because children do not lie. They will let you know what's really going. So anyway, some of the things that they look for, and that police are looking out for, that are seen as signs of extremism, are whether people use the greeting, assalamu alaikum, that's extremist. Uh, veils, head coverings, hijab, abnormal beards on men, meaning anything, big, any kind of beard on a young man is seen as abnormal and dangerous. Uh, clothing that is too long on women, the hem length too long, is seen as extremist. Um, praying too much, or in the wrong place, is suspicious, or having relatives who do this. There's been, for several years now, um, rules against certain uh, Islamic baby names, um, 
And I don't know if you can see some of them here. I don't know, it's not very clear, but um, if you can, some of you here can probably read the Uyghur scripts, you know, the version of Arabic. But here, let's see, so Talib is one. Um, this one, what is this? Um, uh, a, 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 a fighter for a struggler for Islam. Uh, oh, oh, right, yeah, yeah. right. So, but, uh, you know, Muhammad, um, Maria, Fatima. You know, even those names are also, you know, are also forbidden. Uh, what other things? Um, so you know, the star and crescent symbol. See here any kind of Islamic symbolic symbolism like this? I think I've seen Professor Jonathan Brown wearing a T-shirt like this one time. <laughs> Watch out, that. Um, mosque attendance. Uh, people, many of the neighborhood mosques, smaller mosques are now closed across Xinjiang. The larger ones are open with all sorts of metal detectors and scanners and so on. But people are afraid to go because you have to register your identity before you go in, um, and that could get you thrown into the thrown into the camps. Even references to the moon in names, so, so the Turkic word I, it's very, very common. I Google, I know what those kind of things. That could be problematic. Um, weddings that are too simple. <laughs> Sign of extremism. Uh, they maybe don't use music um, or too, re too religious. Um, there was a woman who was put in a camp for cleansing a corpse before a funeral, so Islamic style funerals. And there's a big push across China now for universal cremation of bodies. And one of the most chilling things, I don't, I'm hoping we misinterpret this, one of the most chilling pieces of news uh, was again, government bids for workers at uh, new crematoria to be built uh, across Xinjiang. Uh, and there's a, again, the, the feeling is that this is a push to change funeral practices, not to hide corpses. Um, but it's just scary nonetheless. The Quran, reading the Quran, uh, the wrong kind of books on one's shelves, visiting Sufi shrines, which is of course part of traditional uh, Uyghur practice, um, praying with feet too far apart or hands too high up on the chest, um, refusing to eat non-halal brands, uh, refusing to consume state TV or radio, or appearing not to do it, not smoking, the sign of extremism. Not drinking, the sign of extremism. <laughs> Any kind of connection with foreign, uh, with foreigners, um, relatives abroad, people who studied abroad, desire to go abroad, having traveled yourself, in particular to 26 sensitive countries, but also to the United States, Australia, Europe, Western countries, obviously, which are seen as critical uh, by China, um, and so on and so forth. There are many of these kinds of things. And the list is so broad and diffuse that it, of course, functions as a way of, of terrifying people. Um, you don't quite know what sort of behavior could get you in trouble and thrown into the camps. Um, fasting in Ramadan, for example, is another one of those things. So uh, it has the effect of really trying to secularize the society. Um, now, even outside these camps, and even for a few more years, this sort of campaign against uh, you know, Islam, it really is a campaign against Islamic practice, has been going on for some time. And, and we see you know, recently, um, as I mentioned, mosques are being, are being closed. Uh, here you see this shuttered mosque has a big sign. It says, love the party, love the country. It has a Chinese flag on the top. Um, the crescent moons have been taken off of the top of mosques all over the region. Uh, but this is interesting because there used to be a slogan that you would see very often um, in Islamic settings and in, even in mosques. Uh, it wasn't ai dang ai guo, it was ai guo ai jiao. So love the country, love the religion. So the religion has been dropped out of the equation and the party has been substituted into this slogan and these new phrases. Um, here the testament of faith is removed, as you can see from the gate of this mosque in Urumqi. This is a big one in the central Urumqi, the Ardao Chao. Um, the moon is still there, I guess, on the, on the roof of the main dome. Um, and then, this has been going on really for over, over a decade, but you know, the old city of Kashtar uh, was essentially condemned um, on the grounds that it was unsafe in earthquakes, which may have been somewhat the case. 
um, but it has, of course, survived for centuries. Uh, and as a way of ameliorating that, it was decided that much of it needed to be torn down, and the people, and this is actually, so in some places it looks rather chaotic like this, um, but some of the parts of the older, really central city was really very beautiful, very quiet, clean, and, and well constructed. Uh, but not, of course, easily penetrable by the state, not legible in James Scott's sense, right? So there was a great concern about that. Um, so much of this has been torn down uh, in recent years. People have been moved out to new skyscraper developments outside of the city, you know, projects essentially uh, in the outskirts. And this has been going on for years. A real blow to Uyghur culture in that Kashgar is really the heart of particularly southern Xinjiang, but the sense of this old city is the heart of Uyghur culture. Um, and then the old city has been replaced by a kind of Disneyfied version simulacrum um, of itself, uh, shown here, of course, with more, with more dancing, more dancers. There's an ongoing campaign against uh, uh, other kinds of Islamic symbols. It spreads to uh, Hui and other Muslims in China as well. Um, here you see in this sign that the haji has been removed there. And then a Chinese, this man's name is Bach, Bach Haji. So Bach, they leave the ah in Chinese, so Bach ah, mm -hmm. Uyghur traditional medicine. Um, but there, again, it's a, and down here in English, even too, they caught it. Let's take the G away. Uh, Wei, uh, those of you who know China at all, you know that the, the, the Chinese Muslims are famous for Niu for their uh, old beef noodles. Um, and this, but this Huizhou Niu Romian shop, um, they decided it was better not to be Huizhou anymore, and they substituted it with words that mean one family, uh, echoing one family ideology that's very Confucian. It's also a big part of Xi Jinping's arguments and his, his ideology these days. The campaign against halal here uh, being framed in a quite widely circulated uh, editorial, being framed as um, halal eating is not scientific, it's not modern. Um, at the molecular level, pork and lamb are all the same, so why not eat both? Right. That's kind of the argument. Um, similarly, there's been a big push now to kind of redefine the history of the Uyghurs uh, and, and relative to a, a conception of, of, of Gen generic and general Chinese identity. Um, and that's a term which in Chinese is, it's not the word Han, although it has all the characteristics of Han, it's Zhonghua. And this is kind of this new generic term which is becoming more and more important in ethnic discourse in China today. Um, and uh, the argument here you see is that Uyghurs are not descended from the Turks, or, and some have even gone as far as to say the Uyghur language actually derives from Chinese as well. Uh, but the Zhonghua is the source of all ethnic diversity in China. I'll talk a little bit about more, a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so besides the camps and all these other phenomena that I've been talking about, there's been um, quite widely reported uh, securitization of the entire region. Some people say that really life in Xinjiang is like living in a camp uh, itself. Uh, and this began really with the arrival in Xinjiang of a new first party secretary, Chen Quanguo, uh, who came from Tibet, where he was responsible for rolling out a system of grid policing there uh, that was quite effective in, in dampening down unrest. Uh, they had big riots in Tibet in 2008. He was seen as a real troubleshooter who, who did a good job. So they transferred him into Xinjiang, where he started rolling out a similar kind of grid policing system. Uh, and here, just so quickly, I'll run through. You can see these convenience police stations in various places. So you're tucked into old Kashgar um, as well. The scholar Aaron <coughs> Byler did a little study of uh, these convenience police stations around Xinjiang University, which is mainly Uyghur, you know, mainly Uyghur students study there, around the university in Urumqi. Just map them out um, with Google Earth. And you can see how they really kind of enclose the campus with this network of police stations. <coughs> so besides, you know, within this network, of course, there are uh, constant patrols of police marching around, uh, often driving around in, uh, in cop cars with the sirens going, constantly as a reminder of their, of their presence. Um, 
And there's a famous uh, high-tech aspect of this. Uh, this includes all sorts of all sorts of things, in particular facial recognition cameras, which are, which are quite famous now for all, all over China. Uh, these are linked to ID cards uh, and um, and to your photo that's in the system, and they can track people very very well. We've Show you. Uh, in the video, you can look this up online if you're interested. They can track vehicles and people um, as they move around the city in real time, and it keeps a record of all the various places where people have been. Um, there's face scanning technology on phones. The police can scan your face, check to make sure that you are who they say you are, keep a record of that. Um, other biometric information that's been gathered very intensively includes uh, you know, iris data, so iris scans, uh, fingerprint, blood type, voice print, uh, gait scanning of how you walk. We've been scanning people with 360 views of this. Uh, and then through a series of free, free checkups, which were mandatory for everyone over the past year or so, uh, DNA has been gathered. And all of this information is put together uh, in one's individual file and linked to your ID card and, of course, to your, to your face. So there's a huge database now on all of the people uh, in, in Xinjiang. And to some extent, this is expanding to other parts of China as well. Uh, but there's also been a behavioral survey that people have been forced to take um, because it's administered through your place of your housing or your, or your school, or sometimes children are forced to make your parents do it. Um, and this codes all sorts of aspects of private life um, of yourself and your relatives, including you know, religious practices, um, your ethnicity itself. Um, you lose points based on if you're a Uyghur, that kind of lowers you a little bit from the baseline. Uh, prayer, um, again, foreign contacts, all of those kinds of information you can see. Uh, go into the coding, the scoring of this, and of course the numbers are crunched. And that number which results from this uh, gets you ranked as safe, uh, unsafe, uh, safe, normal, or unsafe. Uh, and that in turn determines your access to loans, it determines your access to buying travel tickets, where you can go, certain parts of the city will be off limits to you, and other sorts of things like this. Uh, and I mentioned, of course, already that uh, you know, the cell phone is really the key pivot point uh, to all of this. Um, there's a nanny app which people are forced to put on their phones. It keeps track of everything that's on it. Um, they've now um, developed scanning technology that, that creates quick transcriptions of, of voice and of Uyghur language transcriptions, and so they can go through and see you know, what's even, they, they can gather even what's being said in voice conversations like this. And of course, any kind of foreign calls or texts coming in, they you know, ping something in the AI system so that people know about this. All right. So let me, in the interest of time, I really get on to just some of my interpretations for this and kind of the background uh, for some of this. Why is this happening? Why is this happening now? Uh, how does it fit in with it's admittedly a, uh, you know, a history of certainly not uh, of mistreatment of minority groups in China uh, in general, particularly Uyghurs and Tibetans. How does that fit into that broader pattern? Um, first of all, without giving too long of a history lesson, um, I just want to highlight that when this region came under Beijing's control for the first time in the 18th century, 18th century, this was under the uh, Qing Empire. Uh, and the Qing Empire generally, as, as many empires do, uh, ruled through a sort of pluralistic system. This is not democratic pluralism at all, it's very top-down. Uh, but they knew that it wasn't a useful tactic, it wasn't useful practice to try to interfere on the ground level with people's culture too much. Uh, and they tended to, to put, um, well, they didn't tend to. In Xinjiang, they very explicitly put Uyghurs under the control of Uyghur officials, Mongol groups under Mongol officials, Han under Han officials, and so on, use this kind of uh, ethnically uh, segregated system. Uh, 
an, an administrative and legal pluralism to more or less keep people happy while they sort of control things from a higher level. Um, uh, and again, one could sort of debate the overall success of this. It was an empire after all. It was a you know, uh, you know, imposed rule. Uh, but as empires go and as imperial territories tend to fare, Xinjiang did pretty well under the Qing. Um, from you know, the historian's point of view, from, a, from some distance, you can see that populations increased broadly. The economy did very well. Uh, there was expansion of uh, arable land and other sorts of measures like that. So yeah, again, it was a successful imperial venture for the Qing. Uh, the Qing dynasty uh, fell in the early 20th century. For a few decades, there were a combination of Qing or former Qing officials, uh, Han Chinese governors, warlords ruling in the, in the region. Uh, and very broadly, you could say that those rulers who continued this kind of pluralistic approach, maintained the balance between different ethnic groups, did pretty well. Um, they ruled for 10, 15 years sometimes. Uh, those who didn't, it all blew up in their face very, very quickly. We tried to impose uh, Chinese ways on that. So that was the background. Uh, the PRC took over the region in 1949, uh, but uh, already since 1937, uh, a system of a system that resembled the Soviet system of uh, multiple nationalities had already been implemented in Xinjiang. So there was recognition of Kazakhs and Kyrgyz and Uyghur and Chinese and Manchu and Mongol. Different groups uh, were recognized by the by the state in, in Xinjiang, and certain resources were allocated to them on the basis of their of their ethnicity, uh, and that is in a kind of microcosm, the kind of system that the PRC applied to its minorities around China um, over the next decades. Um, this word for nationality or ethnicity in Chinese is, uh, is minzu. And so scholars for shorthand refer to this as, as the minzu system. Um, and in broad strokes, it's similar to what's sometimes called you know, the empire of nations in the Soviet Union, or the affirmative action empire is another famous term, right, in those things. So in broad, in broad terms, it looked like that. Um, and again, broadly speaking, uh, it was popular and arguably successful, given how difficult it is to take a, a former empire and turn it into something like a nation state, while at the same time maintaining the facade that you are um, a Leninist party opposed to imperialism. Right? It's difficult to take over an empire if you're you know, anti-imperialist. So how do you do that? So, um, the difference between the Soviet approach and the Chinese approach, though, approach in ideological terms um, is, is subtle but important. Uh, you know, the Soviet Union was not called Russia. But of course, China was not going to run away from the Chinese tradition uh, in forming new China. Right? And so there's always been this tension between uh, what is the broad identity of China as a as a state today uh, versus the identity of one of those 56 minorities, the Han people, right? And how do non-Han peoples fit into a modern Chinese state? And so there's you know, various ways to deal with this. Um, as I said, the kind of top-down multicultural or top-down uh, pluralism of the Minzu system was the way that China struck upon to do this, uh, broadly popular among the minorities. and the, you know, in anthropological terms, the explanation for this was articulated most famously by an anthropologist known as uh, Fei Xiaotong. Um, and his work was published in 1989 with some fanfare. Um, and he argued that the 56 minorities, or 56 ethnic groups of China, you know, each have their own existence, their own integrity. Um, but that the Zhonghua, the Chinese ethnicity, the Chinese identity, rests on top as kind of a crystallization or a culmination. Um, and of course, he's saying you can have multiple identities at once. There's higher level and lower level ones. Um, all of that is more or less in keeping with, I think, what anth anthropologists everywhere would accept. Fei Xiaotong was obviously essentializing the idea of Mimsu, the idea of ethnicity, into making it a historical they trace those all the way back through time. But nonetheless, this idea that there can be a broader national identity on top of this individual identity was the system that they had. Um, now, 
After 1991, when the Soviet Union fell apart, there was great concern in China, among policymakers in particular, that the reason the Soviet Union fell apart was because, precisely because of its ethno-national system, right? that it had maintained these divisions as fault lines rather than blurring them and just making them disappear. Now, that's not uh, how most scholars in the West would interpret the fall of the Soviet Union. It was obviously a very complex event. But that was one main theme that Chinese thinkers and policymakers saw as a problem, and it worried them greatly because they thought this could be a ticking time bomb for China as well. And so around about 2005, a policy debate began uh, in the journals of uh, ethnicity studies journals and in party journals um, over this means of system. Should there be a second generation means of system? Should this system be depoliticized so that the, the so titular uh, autonomous regions, autonomous provinces, and uh, autonomous counties shouldn't have the name of a particular means on them? So various kinds of things were, were proposed along those lines. Um, and one of the arguments that was put forward was to um, you know, bring in a melting pot based on a belief that the melting pot was an accurate representation of how ethnicity was dealt with in the West, and particularly in America, to replace an hors d'oeuvres style with a melting pot was one argument. Uh, this debate was quite divisive uh, because the Minzo system is deeply entrenched in the very structures of government. You know, all the way from the bottom to the top. Um, and of course, the non-Han ethnic groups themselves uh, have a lot of stake in this, in this system. In 2014, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping convened a central ethnic work conference where some of these things were talked about. He delivered a speech which was, after he, was, after he delivered it, it was much debated, and there were some things in it that both sides of the debate could use. But in retrospect, looking back on it, we can see that he was really signaling a shift. Not necessarily an abandonment of the first generation for a new generation, uh, but certainly a shift in how ethnicity and should be interpreted uh, and, and ethnic groups should be dealt with. One thing he did was to say that in addition to material concerns, spiritual concerns were also important. Uh, so Jin Shen Chang, the plenty, right? Um, now, that was a signal that um, raising standards of living for restive groups would not necessarily be enough. And this is something that people who recognized. You know, Tibet's standard of living, Xinjiang's standard of living was higher than it had been. Um, nonetheless, these issues still continued. So beside that, you needed to work on spiritual conditions. Cultural identity, he stressed, was very important. Uh, and he rolled out an idea of, um, that, that that Minzu, Nanhan Minzu, must adhere to the four identifications. Okay, so. Um, identification with the motherland, identification with the Chinese nation, with Chinese culture, and with the socialist road with Chinese characteristics. So in other words, ethnotic, uh, um, economic development itself was going to be no panacea for resolving what we're seeing as very serious ethnic, ethnic problems. Um, and new words came into, this, into the discussion, uh, into the discourse. Um, mingling, for example, jiaorong was being talked about as more important. The, the ethnicity needed to mingle more, uh, even fusion. Uh, and Xi Jinping argued in his speeches that Chinese history was itself a continual process of inter-ethnic mingling and fusion directed towards achieving all under heaven great harmony, Tianxia Datong. So again, drawing on this kind of Confucianist language that he's very fond of, making the point that uh, the way in which harmony, all under heaven, and of course national greatness in the China dream would be achieved would be by mingling together, erasing the differences between uh, the, the Minzu, which the old system had in fact precisely maintained and celebrated. Now just Two or three days ago, the Chinese State Council released a white paper about the situation in Xinjiang. And it's a response to a lot of the criticism that they, they've been getting um, lately. And a lot of it talks about so what's going on right now in the region. But there's a, a historical preamble, which I found quite interesting. Because um, it stresses that the, the Zhonghua Minzu, so the, the Chinese 
identity, Chinese ethnicity, uh, is the root, is the source, that Chinese civilization is the source of other Minzu culture, uh, all of which arise out of that. And it says this in several different ways, uh, and it even uses historical examples. Um, what has happened then is that that old um, kind of inverted, let's see, that old pyramid that Fei Xiaotong had talked about with the Zhonghua identity on top of all the 56, that's now been flipped on its head. And China, Chinese civilization, is seen as the root from which the other Minzu have developed out of, diversified out of. But they need to be pulled back in uh, together again. All right, so what I'm arguing here, and I think, you know, obviously there are various reasons for this. There's concern about uh, political violence and unrest on the ground, and I can talk about you know, some of those incidents if you want to uh, in the question and answer in a minute. Uh, but I think the ideological background to what's going on now is precisely this shift towards an assimilationist approach to cultural difference, away from what really was a multicultural approach with Chinese characteristics that China has maintained, not just since 1949, but which really has roots in imperial China as well. A kind of pragmatic multiculturalism uh, is really part of the Chinese um, Chinese tradition. And that, of course, is a great, is a great irony. Um, because the way I see it, what's happening right now is that in chasing after a kind of homogen homogeneous national population and trying to kind of create one through brute force, uh, China is actually turning its back on its own particular multicultural traditions, precisely at a moment when those multicultural traditions would be, uh, would be interesting at least and perhaps useful for the world at large to see. Right? Given that we have so much problems with diversity and you know, every, every society is debating these and struggling with how to deal with them, China has its own history to put forward of how it, of how it dealt with them. Um, and you can see that. In fact, in one, in one realm of policy, China is actually trumpeting its own kind of multiculturalism. Many of you will be familiar with this kind of image. Um, it's from the Cultural Revolution, but it's, it's been perpetuated ever since. You know, the happy, smiling, usually dancing nationalities in their national garb, you know, arrayed, representing China. And this has been a very, very strong, continuous way China has represented itself. You can see this at the Beijing Olympics in particular, right? And we sort of laughed at it because a lot of the kids dressed up like this were actually local Han kids from elite Beijing schools. You know, they weren't really nationalities. But nonetheless, this is really the, has been the China brand. Um, all right. The realm in which we're seeing this kind of uh, Minzuized representation uh, being perpetrated, uh, being perpetuated now, uh, is in the rhetoric and propaganda about China's Belt and Road. And I just want to end with a little clip um, about that. This is a recent propaganda video that's come out about. You all know the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, China's grand. Uh, developmental scheme for Eurasia and actually Latin America and other places are included in it as well. So this is um, this came out a couple of weeks ago, I think. Um, it may be excruciating to some, but I'm going to let it play almost two minutes. So <laughs> bear with me. And some of you will recognize the tune now.
this kind of headgear, of course, is illegal in Xinjiang now, and people thrown into a camp. <coughs> time I was sort of out of the picture in 2008 with the Olympics there seemed to be a real wave of paranoia and I also I've just been in Kazakhstan where there's kind of, I mean they're kind of self-hating Muslims in a way they're also paranoid I think about some of the same things uh, I think a lot of but my, my theory is a lot of it is internet driven and then paranoia about the contagion of extremist ideas uh, I just want to hear your yeah, so, to that. so the argument right now for why Uyghurs are dangerous in China is that they, they've been infected with ideas that come in mainly via the internet, but through you know, other means like this. Yeah. Um, and you know, they're vulnerable minds that you know, are infected by this. Um, and that, of course, you know, it, there has been influence um, from some of these, uh, some of these quarters. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about the kinds of political violence um, and other violence that's happened. Um, I draw certain distinctions because I think if you're trying to figure out the causes, you need to distinguish sort of what they are. Um, I mean, through, from, from 1997, there, there, some incidents earlier on than that, but looking more recently, from 1997 through 2008, there was really nothing that happened, at least that we know about, no large-scale demonstrations, no riots, no terrorist acts. But throughout that time, and particularly after 2001, there was this drumbeat in China, and also outside of China, and in the Western media, and particularly kind of the think tank world, the you know, anti-terrorism industrial complex, has a lot to answer for that. Um, and so talking about it, and it didn't really happen until after 2008, we started seeing incidents that sort of fit the template of you know, jihadist terrorist attacks, by which I mean um, attack, random attacks on civilians, but you know, with, with religious coloring, perhaps, um, that you know, are meant to make a point like this. I'm distinguishing that from other forms. For example, a bunch of men attack a police station, maybe with agricultural tools or knives. Um, you know, these shed blood as well. Things like this can happen. Um, but it's not so clearly taken from the same kind of you know, back, background or desire to make a point or whatever. So there's been all of those. And in recent years, there's been some horrific terrorist attacks, as well as other episodes of what we might call even small-scale rebellion, um, or certainly you know, unrest in the area. So um, you know, China is very concerned with 
stability, any official in charge of any region in China, one of your main jobs is to make sure things like this don't happen, particularly in China. So they do have you know, this concern of stability. Um, but in terms of diagnosing the causes, of course, the diagnosis that they won't consider is that policies themselves are leading to more trouble. Even though if you, have, if you, if you, if you track the crackdowns and you track the violence, they, they track very, very closely. Um, there was one event that not a lot of people know about that it's worth talking about, or one thing that happened. And this was in the aftermath of 2001. Uh, a few months after that, uh, China very, very quickly rebranded its separatist issue in Xinjiang. They had talked about it before as counter-revolutionary, as separatism, as pan-Turanianism or pan-Turkism, and pan-Islamism. Uh, but they hadn't really talked about it as Islamic extremism or, or, or terrorism, particularly. Um, they did. The global War on Terror was the opportunity. They just changed all the rhetoric around this. Uh, and they signaled that, in particular, with a white paper that came out early in 2002. And there they, it was an interesting paper. I reviewed it and read it quite closely at the time. It gave a whole number of, a whole list of different groups and organizations, a real alphabet soup of different groups, and said, look at all these terrorist organizations that exist. Um, and then it gave a list of acts that had happened, things that had gone wrong, 62 deaths, 144 injuries from terrorist acts over the previous 10 years. And for the next five or seven years, they would constantly say, look at the 62 and 144 acts that happened over the past 10 years. It was kind of a moving 10-year period. Uh, it never became 11 years. It was always 10 years. But in any case, that was this document that came out. What it didn't do was ever to connect specific acts with specific groups. Uh, it was kind of a generic way of talking about East Turkestan forces. East Turkestan is a term which many Uyghurs uh, you know, use as their national name. Um, there were a couple of East Turkestan republics in the past. So there's a kind of generic way of talking about that. Now, in, I think it was November of 2002, uh, the United States was looking for China to, uh, to sign on to a UN resolution which was uh, recognizing that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and had violated its terms of its earlier agreements like this. Um, this would become a, doc a resolution that the Bush administration would look to as a UN justification of um, the, the, the invasion of Iraq. Um, that's controversial whether that's what it meant or not, but in any case. So we wanted China to sign on to that. Uh, in return for that, uh, the Bush administration agreed to list a Uyghur group as a terrorist organization, as an international terrorist organization. So they looked at this list, they found this one group uh, ETIM, East Turkestan Islamic Movement, um, which was very small. And I actually talked to someone in the State Department at the time. He said, yeah, that's why you picked it, because it's really not to anything. But it did seem to have, it was, they had camps in Af Afghanistan. They seemed to have some kind of connection with Osama bin Laden, although these relations were strained. And subsequent stories that have come out, they seemed to have had, had one AK-47 that they took turns practicing with and spent most of their time renovating a building. Right. So it was a very small group. Uh, in any case, that was listed. But in announcing this listing, um, the US government statement took the language from the Chinese white paper. And they said that all of the previous acts of the 10 years, those 64 deaths and 144 injuries, had been perpetrated by ETIM. Mm -hmm. And so the US government really created the specter of an organized terrorist movement, terrorist group which had done all of these things over a 10-year period in Xinjiang. Right? Which, in fact, there was no such group that had done this. Maybe these things happened, but they were not done by one. And then, of course, you know, many of you will have heard of ETIM, right? It be then became the name to conjure with, and all of the think tanks were sort of chasing it down. And, of course, there's organization charts with leaders, and you know, so all of those got drawn up after that. Um, and the, the ruler, or the, the, ruler, the head of ETIM, was killed a couple of years after that. And as far as anyone can tell now, the organization disappeared. And subsequent groups have sort of claimed to take up the mantle. But in any case, um, so the idea of broad, organized, uh, powerful um, terrorist group of Uyghurs has been grossly exaggerated for a long time. Um, and you know, 
acts have come out that seem to that fit the model, as I said, in the, in the 2013 to 15 period. Um, but in a way, really, it's, it's, those are recent. And all of this could be seen, in, in a sense, as a self-fulfilling prophecy, um, you know, rather than actually the, the, the culminate, the, the final blowing up of the powder keg, or whatever kind of metaphors you know, tend to be, tend to be used. Yes? First, I want to say thank you for this very important and uh, disturbing presentation. Um, you just talked about think tanks and kind of the broader climate of the war on terror, and I wonder how the sort of industry around um, combating violent extremism, CBE, a lot of it based here in DC, is there any evidence that, th that this is circulated to China, that the kinds of curriculum or programs that have emerged here in the US are now being exported to aid programs? that there's been conversations between these groups or circulation of these materials between here and China? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I, I, I don't really know. Um, I'm not connected with those groups in either level. I mean, certainly there's interest, and in, you know, um, you know, China's been visiting think tanks and so on. They send delegations quite frequently to talk about it. Um, there's a lot of interest on the Chinese part in collaboration with the U.S. With the U.S. and the war on terror, which you know, the U.S. has been kind of lukewarm about, right? Be precisely because they know about you know, China's human rights record and have never really seen that big of a threat with the Uyghurs. Um, I I was invited. It was quite surprising to me in 2008, before the Olympics, because everyone thought that Uyghur terrorism was going to be a huge threat, right? I was invited to a meeting. Um, here in town, and there were some of these you know, think tank people there. There were CIA people there, which surprised me. I was there as an expert on the Uyghurs, and that surprised me too, because I'm not really, you know, and I'm thinking, God, if they're asking me, I thought they knew the answers to these questions, right? So um, it was a representative of GE, who was a major sponsor from the Olympics. Um, so they kind of talked about it, and basically it was like, you know, nah, we're not that worried. But, but I was surprised to see that, I, I thought somebody knew the score, you know, what's really happening, the cloak and dagger of these mm -hmm. supposed terrorist groups, and no, yeah. Um, but I, so I didn't really answer your question because I don't know, I don't know the answer. Um, but the techniques and approaches or models of talking about terrorism, you mean, or? Well, there's this whole industry around combating violent extremism yeah. now, like targeted toward ah. Muslims in the U.S. Yeah. Okay. as well as being exported to like Jordan to U.S. aid yes. or. So, all right, you know what, um, I don't know, but I'm interested, in, I'm curious about that because if you read the Chinese statements where they're saying, all we're doing is what you've done, we're combating violent extremism through these means, but we're going to be successful, whereas you have all failed, look at all the problems, right? Yeah. Um, and so they are using that, that language a little bit. Um, the techniques, I think, are different, um, but they, they have adopted some of that, yeah. Yes. I mean, I probably had a similar question just because I noted that a lot of the radicalization or the more extreme versions of Islam, they note, are very similar to prevent and CD models both in the US and the UK. I think that's also one of the parallels. But um, another question I had was like the role of WeChat. I was reading mm -hmm. recently that some of the things that have circulated the most on WeChat have to do with Islam and terrorism as opposed to things that are actually happening in the news like healthcare, etc. And I was wondering if there's been kind of analysis of outside groups manipulating WeChat or spreading misinformation on platforms like WeChat, kind of parallel to the way that's been done in the US. But I don't know if you, maybe we read the same thing. Foreign Policy had a piece on this just the other day or something. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, WeChat is full of Islamophobic kind of materials and you know, alarmist stuff and wrong claims and, and all of this. Um, China internally developed some of it too. There's a lot of kind of fear, particularly if Uyghurs um, I mean, a lot of this is, uh, well, first to answer your question. Um, according to foreign policy, I think there's been a study that's done. A lot of this stuff comes from Western right-wing media. And, you know, and, and, but also, and, you know, the Russian fake news um, machine as well. It's translated into Chinese and spread there. What's interesting there is WeChat is something that the state completely controls if they want to. But they've chosen not to clamp down on Islamophobia at all, um, and they, they let it run rampant. Um, and this has a, you know, a real effect on people's opinions 
as I was saying to John earlier, I think you know, even if people don't believe that all of these things are vocational schools, but they think, well, yes, but these Uyghurs are violent, you know, something needs to be done. Right? And there's an argument that a lot of what is being done, and this is why we see the propaganda, you know, internal propaganda in China, that um, is not all, you know, rainbows or what unicorns peeing rainbows, that it's like um, grim looking stuff. They're saying, look what we're doing, right? They want to see, be strong. Because the main political concern, I, and I would say, I don't know if this is recognized. Well, I, you know, I don't think there's a serious, there, there is not a serious separatist threat. There's not a serious territorial threat from any of this. I would assume people in China know this. Um, there is, however, a political threat if it, it is perceived by the Han majority that these ungrateful minority, ungrateful, violent, barbaric minorities are doing horrible things to our fellow countrymen and the state is not doing anything about it. And that was the immediate reaction after the riots in 2009 in Urumqi, when a couple hundred uh, Chinese were killed. And, and it was a demonstration that went, you know, went violent. Um, and the, the party saw the political threat coming from Chinese. And that's, I think, what they're responding to with a lot of this excessive and indiscriminate cracking down. Yes. The CB program here in the US and the US government are using unfortunately successfully some Muslim clergy and some Islamic organizations to push for their own agenda. Is the same thing happening in China where the Chinese government is using some religious organizations and some imams for their agenda? So the you know, Chinese government has um, worked very carefully to centralize all religious training, Islamic training, uh, within a state Islamic association, and I, um, you might know more about this than, than I do, but, um, and keep a very close rein, always have kept a very close rein on, you know, on imams, um, and use them, and always have used them to deliver propaganda, um, or, you know, the message, um, you know, in, in mosques and, and, and so on. Um, and then that's why they're very concerned about any kind of religious education that happens outside of the mosque, and they particularly crack down on that um, in Xinjiang. Um, as far as the, you know, the, the CBE goes, though, um, I, what we're seeing is something different. They, they've kind of, at least in Xinjiang, they've really taken religious institutions completely out of the picture, right? Literally, you know, shuttering them, making it so that people are afraid to go to them. Um, I think probably many imams have been locked up in them as well, um, along with other elites. And they're using a much more, it, it, it's more Confucianist, I don't say Confucian, but you know, Confucianistic, perhaps, kind of approach with these ideas about, and, and communistic, so communist, Confucianistic idea that um, the individual's identity and thinking you know, can be remade, right, and, and can be remade through these highly ritualized and co coercive means. Pushing people to go through the motions, recite this propaganda again and again and again, will create a new person. Break down the shell and build them up again. That's the rhetoric that they, they use. Now, I was just going to add to that. I had lunch with one of the people uh, uh, who, who was in this program. There was an expert, a British expert, this afternoon. And she was saying how uh, because you have people coming into the house and people coming in and living there for seven or nine days, etc., that it, many Muslims are burning their Qurans, burning anything that would give a sense that they are, you know, are Muslims. So it's not just that you don't cover your head or whatever. You know, you just it's, it, it, you're cleansing simply, uh, you know, because you realize that if you don't, you could be the next one being sent away. Yes. Do you think these trends of persecutions and uh, determinant and uh, intimidation based on religion could affect China's overall uh, constitutional freedoms of religion, at least for the five religions that China or the state has deemed as permissible? Do you, do you think that religious freedom in China could be seeing even worse pressure from the state going forward? Um, well, yeah. I, I, this is a... You know, so religious freedom, 
there's various arguments that they say you have the freedom not to believe in religion. They have ways of turning around. But technically, in the Chinese constitution, there is something that looks like religious freedom, but it has seldom really been observed, and the state can always violate it if it wants to. Uh, now it is doing so in you know, a level quantum quantum level of all the violations that have occurred in the past. Um, and there, there is a broader campaign afoot. Xi Jinping has been eager to crack down on, in particular, um, Islam and Christianity um, with a campaign called Sinification of Religion. So that's applying to um, Islam uh, among the Chinese Muslims and also to Christianity. Uh, a, a lot of this seems to be targeted at architecture. There's a lot of concern about crosses and, and crescent moons on the roofs of religious buildings, and they seem to have been taken down a lot. Um, but the, you know, it's, it's not a good time to be a Chinese Christian either. It hasn't, or particularly in some of the you know, underground churches, um, it hasn't reached the kind of point that it has in, in, in Xinjiang either. But yeah, I mean, absolutely, it's a it's a major campaign against uh, religions that are seen to have particularly outside or foreign connections um, that the state can't control. Yes. Um, I just have a question specifically about, I guess, the government's link between Uyghurs and extreme, um, I guess, religious extremism. Mm -hmm. um, growing up in China, I feel like much of the narrative, like, let's say, entertainment media, social media, uh, or education in general, is kind of putting the Uyghurs as, like, what you were saying, like, uh, this happy image of ethnic minority and removing the Muslim part from it. I was wondering if this is just my skewed education that um, I guess what I was getting out of um, like domestic governmental influence was this completely removing um, Muslim from the weaker identity. Is that different in terms of well, so let me, international? Well, so let me ask you, so you obviously consumed the, that imagery and you know, and you repeat it very accurately. Um, did did you forget that they were Muslim, or did you did you also see them as potentially dangerous, or? Uh, to answer the second question, mm -hmm. no. I think um, so. I'm from the Sichuan region, okay. um, which is where there are a lot of ethnic minorities, which I think helped in terms of my familiarity with ethnic minority and like comfortability with it, but in terms of the Muslim part, I think growing up, I did not know that was part of the Uyghur identity. You didn't know they were Muslim? I didn't know they were Muslim. Okay, interesting, yeah. Right. Well, certainly, right, if you look, you know, the imagery is singing, dancing, um, you see lots of young women, you see right. lots of gnarly, but, but basically, you know, literally toothless old men, right. but not dangerous figures, you know, sort of grandfatherly types. Um, you see young, handsome young men dancing, but other than that, not a lot of you know, healthy, strong young men, right, in the image. And people have written about this, and it's actually pretty easy to, to parse, right? So, um, and you know, as kind of a strategy of representation, um, it tends to feminize minorities um, and you know, make them uh, acceptable, perhaps, right? But at the same time, really kind of diminishing them, right? So that. Uh, it's, it's, yes, minorities, they sing, you know, um, what is it? Um, right? Or right? Right, right. So they can sing and they can dance, right? Um, and that's particularly common with the Uyghurs. And what's interesting, you can still see that even in the propaganda now, you know, about vocational schools and so on and so forth, they always have a dancing scene, right? If you have Uyghur, you always have to have a dancing scene, mm -hmm. which, you know, Uyghurs like to, they do like to dance, you know, and they dance very well, and Uyghur dance is actually very interesting, right? But um, as part of the representation, I don't know how conscious it is, I think right now it's just so baked in to the stereotypes that they just get perpetuated again and again. Um, but it does have this effect of both trivializing and also kind of, it, it, the flip side of it, I think, um, there is this darker flip side which very easily came in particularly after 2008, you know, there were rules that Uyghurs were not allowed to rent hotels in China proper, particularly in Beijing, or so worried about, about terrorism for that. This has actually been extended to a certain extent to anybody who has Xinjiang on their ID card. So even some Han have had 
face discrimination about that. So, you know, there's a dark side and there's the, this sunny side. I think in a way they, they go together, right? If you think about representations of minorities, it's very similar that way often. Um, could you discuss some of the international response to these internment camps or even the lack thereof and where do you expect? I, I think international government responses to go from here. Yeah. Um, so there's been, just to start with the United States, um, you know, Mike Pence has mentioned them in a statement about religious freedom, as has Secretary of State Pompeo. Um, there has been a much more robust bringing up of the issue by Senator Rubio. Um, he's held hearings, quite public. Um, and some of our uh, US ambassador, um, staff in the UN have actually made a point at a couple of hearings to really bring this out. And the first time, this was in the UN uh, Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination back in the summer. And I think it kind of ambushed the Chinese um, representatives of that. So you know, there's been this you know, series of statements that have nothing from the White House um, about it, um, for reasons that aren't really surprising, I guess, um, but at you know, various levels um, from the US. Um, European governments a little slower, but we just saw a kind of démarche by 14 Western governments, or the ambassadors of 14 uh, Western governments in Beijing, and they asked to have a meeting with Chen Chenguo, uh, the party head of Xinjiang, as they you know, go out there. So that was clearly a very public um, expression of concern. Um, so there's, there's some of this, right? You know, the UN is very difficult, right? Now China is, is very powerful in the UN and can really determine what gets brought up, particularly in the Security Council and so on. Um, one big question is, you know, sort of where are Muslim countries or Muslim majority countries in this? And um, we were just talking earlier, um, there have been statements from um, Malaysian Prime Minister and Vice Prime Minister, or the Prime Minister on that, or yeah, future. future Prime Minister, yeah. yeah. Um, Kazakhstan is in a very interesting situation because many Kazakhs have been brought into the camps as well. Um, some Kazakh citizens um, who got out ultimately, um, but many, there are many marriages across the border and so on, and people have lost loved ones. Um, and there's a group that's collecting information and names in, in Kazakhstan um, that has some thousand names of Kazakh mm -hmm. relatives or Kazakhs or other you know, Kazakh, ethnic Kazakhs or Kazakh Chinese who are you know, in the camps mm -hmm. like this. So they're advocating for it and pushing. Obviously, you know, Kazakhstan as a government has very close relations with, with China or is concerned about mm -hmm. China um, receiving Chinese largesse and so on. So they've been not happy about, about this, trying to keep the lid on it. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, they may not be able to do that too long. Pakistan is somewhat similar. I mentioned before there's issues of um, traders whose wives have been locked up, have lost their children. Uh, a couple of them demonstrated in Beijing and live streamed it somehow. Um, and there have been some uh, marches and things in, in Pakistan. I believe the Pakistan foreign minister mentioned it in a meeting. Um, but again, for reasons to do with the Belt and Road and uh, Chinese investment and the all-weather relationship that Pakistan has with China it hasn't been uh, an official irritant, at least above the, above the waterline yet. Um, some people say that Middle Eastern countries are, are mentioning it privately. I don't know about that. They're certainly not making any public comments. And, um, and you know, one colleague of mine, Ryan Thumb, um, you know, he says an important thing to remember is you know, Uyghurs are not Arabs. And so the Arab countries don't necessarily see a particular reason to make a thing to do about this. Uh, yeah, did you have? And as a follow-up, I noticed when Pompeo met with the Chinese foreign minister, I think two weeks ago, he pressed him on the issue slightly, and the foreign minister responded, and they've usually been doing this by saying that it's an internal issue that isn't the concern of other countries, perhaps not even denying the existence of camps at this point. Yeah, and that's, of course, that's our standard response in internal issue. This is, this non-interference in internal affairs of other countries is a Chinese, uh, a central tenet of China's foreign policy, which a lot of other countries 
agree and, and approve, right? And particularly other authoritarian countries, they just they don't have clean hands either, so they don't particularly want to get into this. And Trump said the same thing, took the same yeah. position when he was uh, in Saudi Arabia. That, yeah. You know, we're we're not. It's not our job to be concerned with goes on internally. Just CDE and business. Yeah. Right. So you know, that's a popular position in, in a lot of places. Well, so, thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. you.